<coughs> I, as a, an experimentalist, I can control the relative response because if I change omega, I change what all these magnitudes are, and in particular I can change the magnitude of the real part of it. For example, let's suppose I take water. So I have some water, and then I have a particle inside it, and my particle has a permittivity that's less than the permittivity of water. But my particle has a conductivity that's greater than the conductivity of water. So let's graph out what the real part of all this stuff looks like as a function of omega. At low frequencies, what's the parameter that dominates? The conductivity. And I said the conductivity of my particle in this example is greater than the conductivity of water. So when that's the case, <coughs> this value is going to be larger. This is going to be positive. And in the limit where omega goes to zero, it's going to be positive real. And I'll get some positive number that looks like this. When I go to really high frequencies, what's going to be dominant is going to be the permittivity. I've said the permittivity is less, and so this is going to be negative real. And then if I sweep through all the different frequencies and I look at how this graph will look like, we'll get a sigmoidal response that'll look like this. This corresponds to the real part. Now I could similarly graph the imaginary part of the stuff. And if I graph the imaginary part, the imaginary part will look like this. At high frequency, there's no imaginary part because I said it was purely real. At low frequency, there's no imaginary part because there, I said it was purely real. But in the middle, I have a whole bunch of imaginary part. We call this point here the crossover frequency. Because this is the crossover between the point where the cells will be attracted to regions of high electric field, re to electrodes. Here is where they'll be repelled from regions of high electric, or high electric field, which are typically at electrodes. Yeah. Meaning, will this peak magnitude be the same as this magnitude? It won't. So in the limit, this value here is given by epsilon p minus epsilon m over epsilon p plus 2 epsilon m. You are right. I meant sigma. This is going to be the same expression, but with epsilons. In the limit, this can be as high as 1. In the limit here, this can be as low as, or sorry, the highest this can, it's not a, a function of frequency. In general, the highest this can ever be is 1, when epsilon p is infinitely bigger than epsilon m, and you get epsilon p over epsilon p. The lowest it can be is minus 1 half when epsilon p can be ignored, and you have minus epsilon m over 2 epsilon m. <clears throat> OK, so we have this crossover frequency. The crossover frequency is the difference between over here, where your cells or particles or whatever are going to be attracted to regions of high electric field, for example, your electrodes. Here they'll be repelled. So this is a really important spot. This is the spot where there's no dielectrophoretic force. Is it also correct to say that this is the spot where there's no dipole? Exactly. I have plenty of dipole here. It's just that my dipole is 90 degrees out of phase. It's this. 
Every time I have a dipole, there's no field. Every time I have a field, there's no dipole. So the crossover frequency is the point <clears throat> where the dipole I have doesn't translate to any force because it's completely out of phase with the applied electric field. If I created a different geometry, I can make that imaginary part be the important part. So let's consider a different geometry. Now rather than creating one electric field that oscillates back and forth, I'm going to make a rotating electric field. This is not the best drawing in the world. So, I have an epsilon naught cosine omega t in the x direction, an epsilon naught sine omega t in the y direction. Right? So this basically corresponds to an electric field with magnitude epsilon naught that rotates around in a circle. So I have an electric field that's rotating in a circle. That means I also have a dipole that's rotating in a circle. And that dipole that's rotating in a circle will have some phase lag. But now let's consider the torque on that particle based on the phase lag that I have. Right? So let's assume that I have an electric field that's rotating in a circle, and I have a dipole that's perfectly in phase. Will I create a torque? So here I have an electric field pointing in this direction. Do I create a torque? Now I rotate the electric field 90 degrees. My dipole moves perfectly in phase. Is there a torque? Yes, no, help me out. I have a dipole oriented in the y direction. I have an electric field oriented in the y direction. No torque. I rotate it some more. Electric field pointing in this direction. Do I have a torque? No, there's no torque. But now, so now if I have something in phase, it creates no torque. So the real part of the clausius mazzotti factor tells me nothing about the torque in this system. Right? But now let's assume that I have a field that's rotating, and now I have a dipole that's 90 degrees out of phase. So as I'm turning this electric field, the dipole is lagging behind. So now I have an electric field. I've moved it this way. So now I'm applying an electric field here. I'm pulling this charge up. I'm pulling that charge down. Do I create a torque? Yeah, right? And I keep rotating this around. You'll see I keep creating a torque. So what we've been talking about is dielectrophoresis. I have an electric field sloshing back and forth. I have a dipole sloshing back and forth. When, they're, when these two things are in phase, I get a force. And when I solve the equations, I find that my time average dielectrophoretic force is proportional to the real part of this thing, which we call the clausius mazzotti factor. When I evaluate the dielectrophoretic response, I plot the real part of the clausius mazzotti factor. I pay attention to things like crossover frequencies, because the crossover frequency tells me where the net effect of this force goes from positive to negative. It's the point where the phase difference is basically uh, going through 90 degrees. But this doesn't tell me that the dipole's gone away. It just tells me the orientation and time of the dipole with the applied electric field. I take a different problem, and now here all I care about is the imaginary part of the clausius mazzotti force, because the torque I get in this system is only the part that's 90 degrees out of phase. So this is called electrorotation, and we'll talk about it, but it's not the key right now. I show it to you because I want you to be keeping in mind that we've decided to focus only on the force response, and the reason that we care only about the real part is because we care only about the force response. It is easy to think that we did a bunch of phaser stuff and the real part was the real thing and the imaginary part was this mathematical construct. And that, that sort of way of thinking about it is true for some of what we do. But when we get here, when we look at this clausius mazzotti factor, the real part is the part that's in phase. The imaginary part is the part that's out of phase. They're both important. 
They are both physical things. The real part translates to DEP. The imaginary part translates to electro-rotation. If you do traveling wage, wave dielectrophoresis, they end up both making a difference. OK. Now, this curve, this yellow curve, is a way of showing that when we change the frequency of this system, we can change how a particle or a cell will respond. And that's cool and all. But what's even more important is the fact that a single particle has a difference in response, is the fact that different particles with slightly different material properties will have different curves. And that means that by picking my frequency, I can pick out a frequency where I can make interesting things happen. And the simplest case of this is just considering two materials with slightly different membrane capacitances. If I have two particles that have slightly different membrane capacitances, so these are two cells, for example, that have lipid bilayers on the outside, where one is 10 nanometers thick and the other one's 12 nanometers thick, right? Two nanometers. But that difference can change the magnitude of the capacitance. That change in the magnitude of the capacitance changes the real part of the clausius mazzotti factor, which I'll start abbreviating as F sub CM. And if the real part of my clausius mazzotti factor for my two particles looks like this, if I want to spatially separate these particles, what frequency would you use? Anything in between, right? If I go here, particle 1 is going to experience positive DEP. It's going to go to the regions of high electric field. Particle 2 is going to experience negative DEP. It's going to go to the regions of low electric field. <coughs> and so I can take a system where the only difference is that one cell has a lipid bilayer that's 10 nanometers thick, and one has a lipid bilayer that's 12 nanometers thick. And I can make this macroscopic huge difference in where they go. And all I had to do to calculate that was just to put their conductivity and permittivity into a simple algebraic, admittedly complex, but a simple algebraic equation, plot out a simple thing, and there you go.